Yeah. That's part of what uh we're going to some of that tonight, tonight's class. All right. Um self-esteem, but also the culture that exists because of the lack of self-esteem in our community. All right. So Start the class um, as we go through it. You got anything you want to say? Any questions? Any comments? You just raise your hand. All right, that's for everybody in the class. We live online. You know what I'm saying? So shalom to all the brothers and sisters online. You live with the Israelite School of Universal Practical Knowledge. Uh, we in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a Brotherhood class every Tuesday and Wednesday. We hold class in the Benjamin Hooks Library from uh, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Tuesday is a Brotherhood class. Wednesday is a Biblical Law class. Uh, these classes give us an opportunity to go into this book called the Bible to reconnect with our past, with the culture and the, and the heritage and the wisdom that the Most High gave to our ancestors. Um, 2019, the condition that so-called Blacks, Latinos, and Native Indians are suffering in our community is due to a lack of understanding and a lack of guidance when it comes to what's right and what's wrong and what's the way in which we're supposed to walk and live and establish our um, uh, healthy community. If I could, since we just close the door, Bob Kasha. All right, now tonight's class, we, we fresh off the whole Thanksgiving, Black Friday, that whole big weekend, right? So what I want to do with tonight's class was go into the history of Black Friday and touch on the topic of consumerism and economic slavery. And we're going to go into the Bible and see what the Bible says about the culture that exists in the black community of um, materialism and worshiping things and, and the need to have to have things and why Black Friday is such a success every year in America and is largely due to the buying power that exists in our community. All right, so we're going to get, get some understanding of what consumerism is. We're going to go into some history of Black Friday and the true meaning behind Black Friday. Got a lot of people out there, that's, you know, they, they call themselves woke. And they, you know, studying different things. And so you, there's a lot of stuff out there about Black Friday. But tonight we're going to go into what Black Friday actually means and um, what it stands on and why it's such a success every year. All right. Um, before we start the class, I'd like to open up the class to questions. Any brothers or sisters have any questions, you just raise your hand. We got a new brother in the class tonight. He's seen us out here with him in the library asking some questions. We invited him to class. Any brothers or sisters got any class, uh, questions online? All you got to do is just type them in. Uh, anybody have any questions in the class? All you got to do is raise your hand. Any questions in the class? All right. Any questions online? Y'all go ahead and type them in if y'all have any questions online. All right. If nobody has any questions, we're going to get into tonight's topic. I mean, tonight's topic, which is understanding consumerism um, and economic slavery. 
All right, we're going to touch on the whole history of Black Friday um, as we dive into consumerism and what it means for our community and the buying power that exists in the Black, uh, and, uh, that exists in our community that continues to prop up this American society. All right, so I got my Zondervan, by, I mean, my um, uh, Webster's Online Dictionary. I'm trying to pull up consumerism now. All you brothers and sisters that's tuning in the class online, make sure y'all share, get the class out there so brothers and sisters can get in here and um, participate in this class tonight, all right? Okay, here we go. All right. So consumerism, all right? Consumerism is the belief that it is good for people to spend a lot of money on goods and services, all right? Also, consumerism is the actions of people who spend a lot of money on goods and services. So consumerism is the actions of people who spend a lot of money on goods and services. All right. Um, so consumerism is what capitalism is based off of. Is that the, the, the way money works in America today, the way money works in the society is based off. You ever heard the term as a capitalistic uh, free capital society? The way capitalism works is, is op anybody has an opportunity to become rich and become wealthy if they can produce a good or, or provide a service that people want. And the more people want that service or that product, the more, uh, a bit, the more potential there is for you to get rich if you're the one who provides that product or produces that service. Everybody understands. But in order for someone to become successful in a capitalist society, you need to have what is called a, um, there needs to be a, a, a less access to the good or the product that you're providing. All right, so if I, start, if I started selling, if I wanted to get rich in capitalist society and I had grass, and I wanted to sell people grass, I'm not going to make no money because grass is everywhere. If grass was something that everybody wanted, they wouldn't need to come to me to buy grass because grass can be found everywhere. But if I was to, let's say, go around in my community and poison everybody's yard and kill every grass in everybody else's yard and only my yard had grass, <coughs> now I can control the amount of grass that's available on the market. And because I'm the only one that got grass, if you want grass, I can raise up the prices. Therefore, I can get rich. Everybody understands? Now, I use grass, but that's how it works when it comes to any, any consumable good that's on the market. Everybody understands. So when it comes to diamonds, right? Everybody like diamonds. Everybody loves diamonds, right? Black people, we get money. We get, we, you get a little bit of money. You're a rapper. What's the first thing a rapper go do? He go bust down a watch, right? What does that, what's that mean? He go and get a watch and go take it to a jeweler and say, I want you to put as many diamonds in this watch as possible, right? <laughs> The jeweler is going to charge you $50,000 to bust down this watch. Why? Because the jeweler has control of, he has access to the diamonds. So he can control the price that it costs for you to be able to get diamonds put into this watch. Well, if you do some studying and some research, you'll find that there's one company that controls the flow of diamonds coming out of the diamond mines in Africa. And it's called the De Beers Corporation. All right. This is a British corporation that's been in, that's been in business since the slavery days when they first colonized Africa. The De Beers Corporation owns all the diamond mines in Africa. So guess what? They get to determine how many diamonds are available and what the price of diamonds are. But if there was no De Beers Corporation, there's enough diamonds in the mines in Africa for every single person in the world to have diamonds. You understand? Diamonds are not that precious. They're not that rare. There's laboratories now where they can make diamonds. Anybody know how diamonds are made? Diamonds are made when you pressurize coal. Deep down in the mines, coal has been under the pressure of the earth for hundreds and thousands of years. You crush something, crush coal down so much and compress it so much, it turns into a diamond. Well, the white man has laboratories now where they can take coal and they can crush it and they can press it and put it under certain pressure and they can make diamonds. If there's labs where you can create diamonds, then why should anybody have to go pay 50000 to get them Put into a watch. Right. Well, that's capitalism. Everybody understands. Right now, there's people, there's Africans dying in, Af in mines in Africa to make to go get them diamonds out the earth. 
There's brothers and sisters here in the city of Memphis who killing and dying to get money to go and buy some diamonds. Well, they dying over something that really has no value if it wasn't for some system in place that caused the price of that thing to be up here. Everybody understands. So capitalism is the system that creates consumerism. Mm -hmm. Consumerism is 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 the is what drives a person to go and buy things, spend all their money. So what's the, the root of consumerism? At the root of consumerism are consumers. What is a consumer? Anybody know? A person that buys a certain product, right? What does a consumer not do? What What is it that a consumer doesn't do? You said a consumer buys a product, right? What are some other ways that you can obtain something besides buying it? Is buying, is buying the only way that you can... You can learn to make it yourself, right? What what else would you do? Think 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 of other systems that have existed before besides just going and buying something. There was a time trade you could barter, right? Well, a consumer doesn't do that. A consumer doesn't create for himself. A consumer doesn't trade. A consumer doesn't barter. A consumer just buys. You understand? And it's it's, it's important to understand that because. When you are trading with someone, when you're bartering, or when you have the ability to create for yourself, you have a certain amount of power. What power does a consumer have? The, con the consumer is the one who, all he has, only option he has is to buy or not to buy. You understand? But a consumer doesn't really have any power because the thing that they want the thing they're spending their money on is something that they want, right? Well, in this society, we've become consumers. When there used to be a time where we created things for ourselves and there was a time when we had the ability to be able to trade or be able to barter for things. But when you're in a society and you only exist as a consumer, then you're really at a disadvantage. You understand? And you, you're a black man. You Are you from Memphis? Okay, so you're from Arizona, right? In Scottsdale. In Scottsdale, is there a Chinatown in Scottsdale? Right? Is there? Is it? Yeah. I'm, okay, just, I'm asking. In Scottsdale, was there a place where it was like a Chinese neighborhood or area where you could go get Chinese food? A lot of Hispanics. Okay, what else? Okay, Panda Palace. All right, let me ask you this. Was there any East Indians in Scottsdale? You know, East Indians are the ones with the, the, the red dot Indians. The ones that like working at 7 Elevens and stuff like that. No, I'm not talking about Native American. East Indians are Native Americans. We call them Native Americans, right? East Indians, we call them that because they come from the Far East. So the East Indians. Okay, well, Scottsdale may be different. Scottsdale was just mainly black, white, and Hispanic. A lot of white and Hispanic. Okay. 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 I got you. Was, was there a ghetto? Was there a ghetto in Scottsdale? What was the bad neighborhood in Scottsdale where black people lived there? What was that called? So let me ask you this. When you go to Blythe, was there was there a Chinese restaurant in Blythe? One. Mm -hmm. Who was working in the gas station? Like who was selling all of the roll ups and selling all of the synthetic weed and you know, who's who's the cat that you paid your money to at the gas station? Was he black or Hispanic? Middle Eastern. <laughs> they wasn't running nothing. The people that was running something was Middle Eastern, right? All right. The, 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 when when black women went to get their hair, when they went to go buy the fake hair, they go get the weed. Where was they going? Was they going to a black owned shop, or was it a run by Asians? Ran by Asians. Yeah. If if black women wanted to go get their nails done, what what who was in the store doing their nails? Was it black women in there doing their nails? Vietnamese people. Now you see how you just named a bunch of races that are not black, that are not Hispanic, that are not white, and they in the black community in Scottsdale, they everywhere in every black community all over this country. And what are black people doing to the East Indians at the gas station, to the Vietnamese in the nail salon, to the Koreans who run the hair shop? What are we doing? We are consuming. 
We're making them richer. All we're doing is we're buying the products that they're giving us, buying the services that they're giving us. But are we trading anything with them? Are we are they, are they getting anything of value from us? Or they besides our money, what are we giving them? Nothing. So guess what? We don't have no power over those East Indians, over those Asians, over those other races that come in our community. We don't have any power over them except to buy what they're providing or to say we're not going to buy it. But when you're in a position where, guess what? Guess what? Guess what we need in a black community? We live a horrible life in America. Black women have, uh, our, the, our black race has low self-esteem. So guess what we want at the end of the day? A woman just want to go and get her nails done so she can look down and see her pretty hands and see her pretty feet and feel a little bit better. So guess what she's going to do? She's going to go to the nail salon. She's been told that her black hair is nappy and ugly and disgusting in America. So guess what she's going to do? She's going to go to the beauty supply store and buy a weave. She's going to go buy hair to put in her head. You understand? In the black community, when you live in poor and you live in poverty, you just sometimes just want to get high. Just want to forget about the hell that you went. So you're going to go to the gas station and you're going to buy roll-ups. You're going to buy blunts. You're going to buy alcohol. And who's there to sell it to you? The East Indian is there to sell it to you. The Middle Eastern. You understand? Because of the condition that we live in in America, we've been forced into a culture of consumerism. And that culture of consumerism is why we are the ones who are at the bottom in this society, while the East Indians and the Asians and the white people get rich and live good off of us. I see your face. Tell me what you think of right now. It's all good. It's all good. You can... But it's, it's, but it's. And that's why we get treated. That's why we get treated the way we get treated. They do whatever they want. They do whatever they want to do with us. And that and it's important, brother, that we understand this because it helps us to at least be able to know what kind of world we live in. The problem with society today, yes, black people are oppressed, but black people have been oppressed for 400 plus years. The problem is oppression ain't nothing that's new to us. We know how to handle oppression. The issue, the problem is that there's a new generation that's coming up that don't know that there was a time when we weren't as oppressed as we are now. There once was a time that you don't even know about where all the stores in the neighborhood was black. You wouldn't even see a white person in your neighborhood for, unless it was the police or unless you was going downtown where white people was at. You wouldn't have to see white people. You wouldn't even know what an East Indian looked like or smelled like because he didn't run the store in your neighborhood. Black women would go get their nails done. They wouldn't have to go to an Asian to get their nails done because they learned how to do it themselves. The problem is this type of oppression is becoming normalized. And if we don't have these classes to talk about it and discuss it, it'll continue to be normal. The purpose of this class is to bring awareness to the condition that we're in so that we can realize that it's not normal. You understand? The way black people live in America is not normal for anybody. Think if you went to India, right? Went to the land of India. Do you think there's a black braiding salon in India where East Indian women go get their hair braided? Do you think there's Vietnamese women who paint nails in East India? You think so? No, I'm, I'm, I'm saying India, where the Indian, where Indian people are over there in Asia. Do you think there's a Vietnamese nail salon where they painting Indian women's nails? No, because the Indians are the, the East Indians are capable of doing all those things themselves. Well, the way Black people live in America, nobody lives like that on Earth. We the only ones that live like that. We the only ones that are in the land where our ancestors were born and lived. And every other people sell us everything. But we have to do business with other races. And none of the power to create and to build and to establish belongs to our race. And so we have to have these classes and have to have these conversations because nobody else on the planet understands what we're living through. We're the only ones that know what that's like. You understand? And it's a problem because it shouldn't be that way. Because just as well as everybody else has the power to create 
and to be innovators and to be entrepreneurs and to make and be successful in their communities, we have that same power. All right. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to go into the Bible and show you what God said about this condition happening to our people way before it happened. All right. All right. So when you talk about consumerism, the root word of consumerism is consumer. All right. And a consumer is a person who buys goods and services. All right. A consumer is not someone who's trading. A consumer is not someone who's dealing in commerce where he's able to sell also. You understand? Consumers are just people who buy. And that's the position that blacks, Latinos, and Native American Indians have been relegated to in the society that we live in. All right. First scripture we're going to go to is Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 14. As we go through these scriptures, you don't have a, you don't have a Bible, do you? You don't have a Bible? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to. Um, yeah, you weren't prepared. No, it's okay. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah, if you want to, you could use that Bible right there. All right. You got it? Oh, God. All right, no sweat. Let's get Jeremiah chapter 2, um, verse 14. Now, if, you, if you look on this Bible here, brother, there's tabs on the side. If you just find Jeremiah, you can go to Jeremiah 2 and 14 and read along. If not, you could just listen, all right? We're going to see what the, what the scripture says, all right? Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home, home born slave? God said, Is Israel a servant? Who is Israel? When you open up the Bible, right? You read the Bible. The Bible is not a religious book, which is what we've been taught. We've been taught the Bible is the book of Christianity, right? We've been taught the Old Testament was the book of Judaism. But when you open up the Bible, the Bible doesn't say be a Christian, the Bible doesn't say be a Jew. The Bible is a historical and a cultural record of one race of people and their interactions with God and everybody else on the earth. The Bible is about one family, 12 tribes of Israel. It starts off with their great-great-grandfather, Adam. It tells you about his life and dealings he had with God. Then it talks about their great-great-grandfather, Noah. Then it talks about Abraham, who was their, the grandfather of, of Israel. It talks about Israel's father, Isaac, and the dealings that God had with Isaac. Then it talks about God and Israel and what they experienced. After Israel, Israel in his lifetime, he had 12 sons. And before he died, Israel sat his 12 sons down and said, listen very closely because God has something he wants me to tell you. And this man, Israel, told his 12 sons what would happen to them in the future if they obeyed and what would happen to them in the future if they disobeyed. And so this whole Bible is about one race of people and how their lives and their history unfolded based on what God promised their, their ancestors. You understand what I'm saying? So here, when the Bible talks about Israel, it's talking about these children, these 12 tribes, these 12 families. God is asking them a rhetorical question. Is Israel a servant? You understand? Israel, God is asking the question because at this time, what is Israel doing? Israel is in captivity, enslaved. Is that why he gave these promises to them? Read on. Why is he spoiled? As, uh, after is he a servant? Oh, is he a home-born slave? Is he a home-born slave? Is Israel a home-born slave? Was Israel created to be slaves and servants to other people? Were they made to just be happy in their in, in their slavery and in their suffering? Read on. Come on, come. Why is he spoiled? If Israel not a servant, if Israel's not a slave, why is Israel spoiled? You look around. 2019, Blacks, Latinos, Native Indians, our community at large is spoiled. What does it mean to spoil something? If I say this apple is spoiled or these eggs are spoiled, what am I saying about it? If something's past its expiration date, then what does that mean for? It's no good. Well, if Israel spoiled, if, why is Israel spoiled? If we weren't made to be slaves, if we weren't made to be servants, then why are we no good? Look in America today. If you were, if you were to ask a random person, what have black, what have black people contributed to America? What would they say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we contribute. Mm -hmm. I agree. Let me ask you this. What, what would they say black people are good for today in America? 
Now, me and you, we black men, we know the history. We know that this country was built on us, built on the backs of slaves. But who doesn't like to acknowledge that? White people. So let's say we ask the white person, what do black people contribute to American society today? What were they, what are they liable to say? Uh huh. Sex and they food stamps. Drugs. Crime. Damn, I'm talking about that. <laughs> about that. Exactly. Exactly. That's why God is asking why are we spoil. And we, we, if we're not meant to be slaves, we wouldn't, if God didn't create us to be serving these other nations, then why is it that we're known for crime and Section 8 and selling drugs and shooting each other and going to jail? Why are we known for those things? If that's not why we were put here. Just think about that for a second. It's not necessarily a question for you to answer, but that's what God is asking. God is asking, why are we spoiled? God is asking, why are we destroyed? Why are we in this condition if we aren't servants, if we weren't made to be home or slaves? You understand? Right now in America, even though they told us, like you said earlier, the physical chains are off of us, but we still mentally in chain. A lot of us in our minds, we're still slaves, and we don't even know that we're slaves. Case in point, Black Friday came along. What was everybody doing on Black Friday? Everybody was going to shopping. Everybody buying TVs, buying PlayStations, buying whatever the hell they selling. You understand? Why does everybody run out on Black Friday and go shopping? Because they told to go out and go shopping on Black Friday. Did you close this door? That's, that's part of the slavery that exists today. You understand? We are slaves because we do, we do what we're told to do without even understanding or knowing that we're being told to do it. It's a lock it. <laughs> the water says, oh, sorry, Christ. You understand? We, um, that's slavery. Every time Black Friday come around, you just go out shopping, don't even know why. Why the hell you need a new TV every year for the past three years? I know some people have been out there Black Friday shopping every single year. And for what? I just, uh, uh, some a beverage, bubble shot, no strong or nothing. You understand? Uh, I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see, brother. I'll let you know. No sweat. No, no problem. No problem. You understand? But this—that's why God is asking: um, Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? You understand? I take both if I could. All right. Um. So the history of Black Friday is this: Black Friday. Like I said, there's a lot of different things you can find out on the internet about Black Friday. But here's the truth in the real history. Pertaining to Black Friday, all right? Um, if you're a business owner, you run a business, right? And you have a, a ledger. A ledger is what a business does to keep track of its money. Money coming in, the money going out, right? All of the, uh, when the business has a ledger, all of the money, the, what they call the um, uh, expenses are marked in the book and read, all right? And all of the, the money made or the income is marked in black. All right. Black Friday historically was the day. So so on the calendar today, the year exists between January and December. Right. Right. That's that's the year. 2019 is from January 1st to December 31st. Right. But we know, according to the Bible and according to God, that the actual year starts in the springtime. Sure. Right. So why does this calendar exist? It starts in the middle of the winter and ends in the middle of the winter where the white man calls it the fiscal year. Fiscal year, that's an that's a, uh, economic term, all right? Fiscal is like a, is like a, a period, all right? I mean, it's, less, it's like the, the, the money making, all right? So the fiscal year is from January 1st to December 31st. Well, one month before the end of the year, a lot of companies are trying to find a way to get back into the black. A lot of companies is operating in the red, meaning what? They're operating at a deficit for this year. Well, Black Friday was something that was created in commerce to help businesses to get themselves into the black. That's why it was called Black Friday, because after this day, everybody's gonna be in the black. Everybody understands. Now, if you're somebody that's ever worked in the government, whether it be city government, state government, or just worked for a company that was contracted by the government, what happens towards the end of the year? The manager looks at the books 
and says we operating under the budget. <laughs> we got to find some way to get over this budget so that what next year we could request the same amount of money so we can continue to get paid, right? Well, about a month before the end of the year, if you work in the government, they're going to start spending money on stupid shit. They're going to go buy everybody new chairs in the office. They're going to go buy brand new pens. They're going to get you whole new notebooks. You're getting a whole bunch of stuff at the end of the year from your job, and you don't have no idea why. You think they're being nice. No, they're trying to get in the black. Everybody understand? <clears throat> they're trying to find – well, some companies are trying to find a way to be under the budget. Other companies are trying to find ways to make money. You understand? Go ahead. It's okay, brother. If you got to go in, it's 7.42. Yeah, yeah, whatever time you got to go. Tuesday and Wednesday. Yes, we'll be here tomorrow, 7 to 9. Yeah. And tomorrow what we'll do, we'll bring some flyers so you can have the information for our school, have a phone number on there, our website. You know what I'm saying? You can watch the classes from home. If you got any questions, anything you need, you can get in contact with me or the brother. So, what the, the purpose of us building the school here in Memphis is there's a lot of brothers like yourself that should know who they are, and should know where they come from, and should know what the most highest purpose for them is in this life. You understand what I'm saying? Everything that, whatever you got going on, you're in school, you're working, that's what's up. Be successful, become something, be something. But it's. it's Yeah, you, yeah, no. Yeah, you don't want to be one of those. You, but you want what you want is to know who you are, where you come from, and that way, when you go out here in this world, you on an even even playing field because you don't feel like you less than this person or less than that person. And what knowing where you come from does for you is it is it to help you. Everything you go out there and you learn, you'll be able to bring it back to your community and make your community better. So me and this brother, we 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 been places, we've accomplished a lot of things in our lives. The reason why we come back to Memphis and we here in the library every week is because we want to give back to brothers like you and all of these brothers and sisters. Memphis is a place where a lot of black people are doing good, but they don't know who they are. A lot of black people are destroyed because they don't know who they are. The most important thing that we can do is educate our brothers and sisters on who they are, where they come from, and what their purpose is in this life. And the answers, all of the answers to those questions are going to be right here in this book called the Bible. Problem is we've been given the Bible from a Christian perspective, and Christianity don't only teaches you how to be a slave to the white man. And now is the time. Listen, damn that. Yeah, damn that. That ain't what the Bible is about. God don't say none of, none of that. But here's the thing. You're right. You're right. You're right. And so what we need right now is we need some revolution. But the revolution ain't going out and fighting white people and, you know, picking up guns and hurting nobody. The revolution we need is to change ourselves and to change the way we think. And the only way that's going to be accomplished is with class. You know what I'm saying? With getting picked up this Bible, opening it up, reading it, and understanding how to apply it to our life. So that's what these classes are about. You know what I'm saying? So. Going forward, like I said, every Tuesday and Wednesday we're here. You come to mom and have flies and everything for you. So any questions you got, any help you need, you got access to it. You know what I'm saying? All right. Um, so, yeah, so Black Friday was about, was about businesses getting to the blacks. When you're a business like Walmart or you're a business like Kmart or Toys R Us, if people ain't been buying your toys all year, come this time. Come up uh, Thanksgiving, you got a month before years old. You got to get rid of some of these toys. You got to make some money. And so those business owners created a holiday where we just going to, we're going to make a sale for everybody and we're going to get rid of as much merchandise as we can. And that's what Black Friday is about. Black Friday is about Walmart getting back in the black. It's about Radio Shack, and Toys R Us, and all of these companies getting back in the black. They've been operating the whole year. Yeah, not really making a lot of money. Using America's holidays, they guilt and trick people into buying everything they can so that they can make as much money as they can before the end of the year. You know what I'm saying? And it's not a coincidence that Black Friday falls the day after Thanksgiving. What happens in America for Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving, all the family come together. 
your grandmama there, your aunties, your uncles, everybody in your family come together for Thanksgiving dinner. Well, guess what? At Thanksgiving dinner is where you can realize I got to buy gifts for all these people. <laughs> I got to get a gift for grandma, get a gift for Uncle Craig. And you sit there that Thanksgiving dinner and then you go and say, well, shit, I need to go ahead and get started on this, this Christmas buy now. You run out from Thanksgiving dinner, go to Black Friday and spend hours fighting and fighting and, and going, throwing blows in the Walmart to get everything you need so that come Christmas time, shit, ain't nobody got to be disappointed. when. If we weren't such slaves in America, we would realize that Thanksgiving is a celebration of the slaughter of the Native American Indians. Why the hell are we going to get together on a holiday that the white man chooses to celebrate the murder of our brothers? Damn Thanksgiving. I'm not sitting down and, and breaking bread over the celebration of white people being able to conquer the Native Indians. But we got rid of Thanksgiving, and guess what? And we also understood the Bible. We know that Christmas ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. Christmas ain't got nothing to do with the Bible. Christmas is in the Bible, and God said it's an abomination. Jesus Christ wasn't born on December 25th. You understand? Jesus Christ, Christmas trees and decorating trees ain't got nothing to do with Jesus. So why the hell are we celebrating Christmas? If we understood the Bible and understood our culture, we wouldn't partake in the white man's Thanksgiving, his Black Friday, or his Christmas. So guess what we wouldn't be? We wouldn't be consumers. We would realize that we ain't got to go out here. And here's the crazy thing about Black Friday. People go out Black Friday and think they're getting deals. <laughs> when on Black Friday, all you're doing is buying stuff at the price it should be all year. That TV that you got for $500 on Black Friday, it's been $1,200 the whole rest of the year. When really, it should only be $500. You understand? So it's, it, there's an entire, the entire economy of America exists and it thrives off our lack of knowledge and understanding of what's really at play. You understand? And because we don't have an understanding, because we have a lack of knowledge and understanding and a lack of independence when it comes to our culture, we are we are bound to be just consumers in this place. All right. Let me get Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight verse forty three. All right. Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight verse forty three. This is God talking to the children of Israel. All right, this is a punishment that he said was going to fall on the children of Israel for not obeying him. Go ahead and read. Oh, the stranger that is within thee shall get above, so like it, shall get up above thee very high. You understand? God said, The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. Who's the stranger in our community? The stranger is the, 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 the Middle Eastern at the gas station, the stranger is the Vietnamese and the, and, and the Korean. At the beauty supply store and at the nail salon. God said they're gonna get up above us very high. Read on. And thou shall come down very low. I said we were gonna come down very low. We were going to be regulated to being their consumers, to being somebody who just buys what they have to sell and have no power or authority to demand a certain quality or a certain standing from them. Read on. Oh God. Verse 44. He shall lend to thee. And thou shalt not lend to him. Everybody understands. You go to the you right now, you need money in the crunch. Guess what? You can go to the bank. You can go to the title max loan office. But guess what? You'll never be able to do. You'll never be able to to you'll never have the power for them to have to come to you for a loan. For them to have to come to you for cash in a hurry. You understand? There's entire uh, uh, uh entire business models that exist off of the poor, the, the poverty of black people. Entire business models that exist off of your desperate need for quick cash, but it doesn't exist the other way around. You understand? Read on. Oh, God. He shall be the head, and thou shall be the tail. And God said that these other nations were going to be the head, and we were going to be the tail, and that's our position economically in America. Regardless of what industry you're in, what what um type of uh, uh you know entrepreneurial venture you have. You're always going to be in a position where you are in you are at the service of somebody else. Everybody understands. You're a black man, you get wealthy, you get rich. Look at the rappers today. We look at rappers like, oh man, they got money, they blinging, they doing it big. Well, a rapper's getting cut a check, right? Who has more money? The rapper who's getting, you know, all the bling bling, or the man, the man that cuts his check. Man that cuts his check. Look at every industry in America. You're a black man. You could be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Guess what? There's an owner above you that signs your check. And what we got to find a way to do is to get out of the position of being in servitude 
and find our way to get back on top. Everybody understands. Go ahead, get you this thing, brother. Go ahead and get up out of here. No way, man. Go ahead and get up out of here. All right, come on through, man. We'll be here at seven. You'll see it. Just look down, look, look for it down in the lobby. You'll see it's coming in. All right. All right. Nah, it's all good, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good, my man. Just do your thing, all right? Enjoy the rest of your day. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Sure, for sure, man. Yeah. Do your thing. We'll see you tomorrow at 7. Nah, we'll be here. Okay, if we not, you just look look for us in the lobby. We'll be through. The, we'll be coming through here. All right. And if we not in the lobby, if we on the second floor, we'll be in a room in that corner over there. If we on the third floor, we'll be in this room. Yeah, just if you could. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, this is 662 number, huh? Okay. Yes, yeah, this is definitely Nah, I missed it. 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 Nah, I missed prophesied the strangers among us getting high and us coming down very low. And that's the condition that we find ourselves in because of, of, of us being regulated to consumers. You look on the TV, you see the Asians beating black women up in the nail salon, locking the doors in the beauty supply store. That's because they don't have any respect for us because they know that economically they have the power because they have the goods that we desperately need and we don't have any authority or any power to do anything except for that buy. But they know because of the slavery, because of the oppression, that we don't know how to not buy. You understand? If, if black people knew how to not buy, then then anytime we call for a boycott of something, we will be able to boycott it. Why is it that black women get beat up in the, in the, in the salon and the black women say, we're going to boycott this salon? What you going to see that next day? Some black woman going in there getting their head done. Why? Because that black woman that's getting her head done, she needs to get her head done. Damn a boycott. Damn if, you know, Chun-Li beat you up. Chun-Li do my head nice and well. Chun-Li, or she's eyebrows right. Chun-Li get these nails popping. I need my nails done, bitch. I'm not going to work with my head not done. You understand? If we knew how to not buy, then there were many a times when something horrible happens to us, we would have been able to boycott. But because of the culture that we have in America, we don't know what it's like to not buy. We don't we don't know what it's like to to suffer not having this good or not having this service for the benefit of our people. Everybody understands. Let me get Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 6. All right. Come on, come on. Come on with it. <coughs> the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 34, verse 6. My sheep wander through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. You understand? The Lord said his sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. You understand? That's the condition that we in in America. Because we don't have our identity, because we don't have our culture intact, we go everywhere amongst everyone trying to find our way. You understand? For the for, for most of us, you know what I'm saying, that, that that stay close to home, that stay in our community, we go and we find the nail salon. We go and we find the beauty supply store. You understand? We go and we find um, these other nations that provide these services that make us feel a little bit better. But for those of us who get a little bit more adventurous, you leave out of the black community, hell, the black woman, the, 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 the black man and the black woman that's not spending their money in the beauty supply store, they go find some yoga studio. They go doing, they going and doing yoga. They going and stretching. Well, who's running the yoga studio? Who's the head of that? Some other nation. You understand? You go, if you, if you, if you, if you, you know what I'm saying? If you're not materialistic, you're into religion, you go and you get in that Christian church and you're paying your time to the pastor. 
And some of us venture out, you might become Methodist or Episcopalian, you understand? Or, or you might become a, a Jehovah's Witness. Guess what's waiting for you there? Some other nation. You understand? Everywhere we go in America to try and find some identity, find some culture, there's a heathen there to take our money. Hey, you won't be black and black, you become pan Africanist. Guess what you're gonna find? Some African tell you about the mother line, take you on a trip to Egypt, <laughs> and you giving all your money to this motherfucker trying to find your way. That's what the Lord is talking about, man. Because we don't know who we are, we don't know where we come from, we scattered amongst all these nations trying to find ourselves. In the 70s and the 80s, it was a big thing. Brothers was trying to be Korean, trying to be Kung Fu. I seen some uh statue today. Some brother in the world, it was some some black, uh, it was a statue, right? Japanese statue of some black samurai. He was like, see, this is where we come from. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You go to Japan, you want to be, be a kung fu master. You go to Japan, they come tell you, find your blackness. You know what I'm saying? And everywhere we go, somebody is there waiting to sell us a drink. Somebody's waiting to sell us an identity, sell us some rich history, some rich culture. When the one that really belongs to us is right here in the Bible. But we don't want to accept that because it don't cost no money. You can't pay to be an Israelite. You want to be an Israelite? You got to change your life. You got to obey God, do what he said to do. Oh, man, them niggas crazy. They in the call. I ain't trying to hear what they talking about. You understand? The Lord said we lost, man. We wandered upon all the hills um, and were scattered upon all the face of the earth. Read on. Don't cut. And none did search or seek after them. And the Lord said none did search and seek after them. You understand? Read on. Come on, come, verse 7. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 8. As I live, said the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves, and fed not my flock. The Lord puts the blame for this condition of our people in the hands of the leaders or the so-called leaders. You know saying? The condition of black people being lost in 2019 lays solely at the feet of every religious leader in the black community, of every so-called politician in the black community, every mayor, every police chief, every governor. They, they are getting rich in America. They are making tons of money. And guess what they're not doing? They're not going to search for God's people. They're not checking on God's people. When they say God said none did search for them, he ain't talking about nobody going looking far and wide. God is talking about nobody checked on them. Nobody made sure they was all right. And this culture that we have in America, the culture that we've accepted, you understand, that keeps us enslaved. If you're a black person that's able to find your way out of the ghetto, find your way out of the, being stuck in the black community, guess what? You never look back. Because why should you? Ask somebody who's gotten rich and got wealthy in the hood that made it out. They'll say, man, the hood ain't never did shit for me. What the hell am I going to go check on them niggas for? All the niggas did was bully me, tease me, tell me I was weird, tell me I was a sucker for going to school and studying, you understand? Or tell me I was a sucker for playing basketball. Cats make it out of the ghetto and never come back to check on the hood, check on their people. And that's an evil thing, man. If you're somebody that's able to make it out, whatever you had to endure, you should see the world and see how other people are living and say, man, my people should know about this. I should, I should go back and tell my people about this. Tell them that there's more to life than them corners that they're standing on. Tell them there's more to life than just that little bit of weed or them little bit of drugs they're trying to get rich off of. Tell them there's more to life than just thinking they a thug or they a gangster. You know what I'm saying? But we don't do that. And that's why the Lord said, those people who make it out, they are the ones that should be the shepherds. They are the ones that's to blame for not protecting us. You understand? Shouldn't be no goddamn black people going into uh, yoga. <laughs> because some nigga that went to yoga and found out that the cat that run it was just having sex with all the women should have came and said, hey, y'all, that's just about some pervert stretching, man. Y'all ain't got to do that. Go stretch at home. That cat just trying to have sex with your woman, man. You know what I'm saying? Or the cat that made it big in Hollywood and found out that it was, listen, they got Billy D. Williams, someone he gender fluid. You know Billy D. Williams is, right? <laughs> Billy D. Williams said he gender fluid. <laughs> this nigga is Lando Calrissian from the goddamn Star Wars. This one is fly, smooth as old cat. He talking about he don't know. Sometimes he a man, sometimes he a woman, sometimes he want a penis, sometimes he want a vagina. So, the hell's wrong with this cat? 
he should have went to Hollywood and found a bunch of freak nasties there and came back and told us, hey, y'all, this Hollywood shit ain't really, it ain't, it ain't all like that. Right. They just gonna try to put something in your mouth. Somebody should have warned us. But God said they didn't warn us. You understand? And them cats, I watched the Malcolm X movie the other day. Somebody from the 1960s should have came out of that Islam and came back to the hood and said, hey, y'all, that's just, man, it's just a bunch of hustling ass niggas, man. They just trying to get rich, selling black people a dream. But nobody came to check on us, man. God said that we, us being destroyed is because they wanted to feed themselves. Too often, we find a way out of the black hood, we find a way out of the hood, and we find a way to come back and capitalize off black people's destruction. When we shouldn't capitalize off our destruction, man, somebody got to stand and be the one that says enough is enough. And that's why the Most High raising us up in the eyes you became the commanding general, Yohanna, so that brothers and sisters can get an opportunity to find a better way, get an opportunity to learn that there's more to life without somebody trying to, you know, take advantage of them. Everybody understand? Let me get Isaiah chapter 47, verse 6. You understand? Why is it that the Lord, why is it that the Lord allowed us to go so long without shepherds? Why is it that the Most High has allowed us to, to sink into this role of consumers in, the, in this capitalist society? What I did get to say earlier, too, is that this system of capitalism is an evil system. This money, the way that money is valued over people and the people's quality of life is never something that the Lord wanted established in the earth. You understand? A lot of times white people like to, to praise their white culture or praise the Greeks and the Romans for their, how they, you know, came up with, with democracy and all these things. This capitalist society is part of the mark of the beast. Along with this, this, this democracy, the, the, the lie that you can vote for your leaders and vote for who's in charge and the majority, whatever the majority says is what we should go along with, that's evil. You understand? What's equally evil is this system that exists where at all costs, you do whatever it takes to get rich. Do whatever it takes for me to have the most and for you to have the least, and that's success. You understand? Nobody says success in America is, you know, I got a decent job. I got, you know, got a roof over my head. And got, you know, there's, America is a place where you can never have enough. You understand? You ask somebody, you know, what, what their dreams or their goals are. Nobody says, you know, I want to drive a Toyota RAV4 <laughs> and live in a three-bedroom apartment and, you know, <laughs> and live a mediocre life. That, America don't allow you to have uh, America. If you if that's your dream, they say that you don't want enough out of life. Right. Or you undervaluing yourself. You're supposed to want a giant mansion and sit on three acres of land and you know all these things. Not taking into account, I don't need all that to be happy. I don't need all that to survive. You understand? But America is a place where the greediest are rewarded because they're the ones that's willing to do anything it takes to make sure they have everything and they don't care about nobody else. You can't have a thriving society where you can't care about nobody else. What kind of place are you creating then? That's why the Lord, when he gave us, when he gave us these laws about how to establish our communities and he, he said for the farmers, if you a man that grow grapes, man, let some of them grapes fall on the ground for the poor to be able to have it. You make corn, some of that corn go fall on the ground, leave some corn, leave a corner in your field for the poor to have it. That's not capitalism. If in America, if they left enough, you know, left enough sprinkled around for everybody to have what they need, then nobody would be able to get rich. Look at the health. Look, I mean, look at every single sector in this country. Look at healthcare. If there was enough, you know, if there was, a, if there was a, if you was a company that created medicine, you create some type of flu medicine. If you made sure there was enough flu medicine for free for the people who couldn't afford the flu medicine, then how would you ever make enough in the stores if the poor people would able to just get some? Use a company that, you know, created hell painkillers. If there was enough painkillers for everybody to be able to get whatever they needed for free, then you wouldn't have people selling drugs, for, you know, you know, wouldn't have a prison system that's built on people selling illegal drugs, people taking illegal drugs, overdosing, police ambulances picking them up, bringing them to the hospital, servicing them, treating them. Them not having insurance, and you get to charge them $60,000 for a hospital bill. And this whole system exists 
for the poorest of people to continue to be entrapped and ensnared and their bloods forced taken from them. Everybody understand? This place is not a place where the poor can live decently. Because the poor being so poor and being so destroyed is what drives the people in the middle class to become ruthless and propels them to being the rich and the few that have everything they need. If you lived in a society where being poor was, you know, uh, was a mishap or something that you was like, damn, that's messed up, but it really wasn't that bad, then in this white man system, they feel like that everybody would just choose to be poor. Everybody would just choose to be broke. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that's not the way that the most high intended for it to be. And there's a way to motivate people besides the threat of being poor and broke and homeless. You know what I'm saying? But that's the way that the white man chooses to to uh, motivate people. All right, let me get Isaiah chapter 47, verse 6. Oh, and, God. <clears throat> the book of Isaiah chapter 47, verse 6. I was wroth with my people. I have polluted my inheritance. The Lord said, That's like, I have polluted my inheritance. The Lord said he was angry with his people. He was the one that polluted his inheritance. Meaning what? The Lord is the one that allowed us to fall. The Lord is the one that allowed us to, to be without a culture, to be without an identity. You understand? But us being in that condition and us being in that state does not excuse what our oppressor has done and all the different ways that he's, you know, made systems to oppress us and to enslave us. Even though God was angry with us because of our disobedience, and even though the Lord is the one that put a stain on, on, on the children of Israel, okay. the Lord didn't mean for us to be destroyed. Read on. And given them into thy hand, thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. You understand? The Lord said he gave us into, into our enemies' hands. You understand? But our enemies did show no mercy. Upon the ancient thou hast very, very heavily laid thy yoke. You understand? Our oppressor has put a burden on the Lord because of how cruelly they treated us in this place. Even though the Most High allowed us to go into captivity, even though the Lord was angry with us for our disobedience and for the ways that we continue to go against him, the Lord did not give the okay for what's being done to us in this place. For all the different ways that we've been taken advantage of because of our lack of understanding, or our lack of, you know, knowledge and, and, and uh, of who we are and why these things are happening to us, our enemies have done a very cruel and evil thing in all the ways they've taken advantage of us. You understand? And the white man has literally offered black people up to every nation on the earth as, you know, um, food. If you give it, like the brother sat here and said he's from Scottsdale, Arizona. In the black community in Scottsdale, you understand? There's Asian Asians running the uh, the beauty salons. I mean, Asians running the hair stores. There's Asians doing the nails. There's East Indians at the gas stations, Arabs at the gas stations. That's all across this country because every country that America has gone to war with, America's apology was giving them businesses in our community. After World War II, America did what? America fought in the Korean War, right? Well, after the Korean War, after all of the murder and the death of the Koreans, the white man said to the Korean government, hey, give us some good Koreans. We guarantee you we'll give them an opportunity to get rich in America, and they'll come back, and they'll bring money back to Korea and stimulate the economy. The Koreans said, all right, how y'all going to do that? White man said, don't worry about it. I got you. Gave all Koreans free licenses to open beauty supply stores in our neighborhood. That's not a coincidence. That ain't something that just happened by chance. The Koreans ain't wake up one day and say, you know what? There's a black hair market. We're going to target it. Now, the white man said, hey, send your, send your Koreans. We'll give them beauty salons in the black community. Because the white man had a plan to demonize black appearance, to demonize the black hair, to demonize the black skin, to demonize, you know, everything about ourselves that we should be proud about. The white man said, I'm going to make them hate it. And I guarantee you Koreans going to have a market. That's why there's Korean. That's why all the beauty supply stores is owned by Koreans. Because the white man had to pay for going to war with Korea. White man went and fought in Vietnam, bombed the piss out of the Vietnamese. Killed a whole bunch of Viet Cong in South Vietnam. 
Well, to all the good people in North Vietnam, the white man said, we sorry for blowing up your country and destroying your whole land. Give us some of your good Vietnamese. We'll let them come to America and we'll make them get rich. Vietnamese said, well, how you going to do that? White man said, don't worry about it. I got you. Gave all the Vietnamese the beauty, the nail salons. Nail salons and gave them, what, fun restaurants? You understand? It's black, it was that Vietnamese soup. Said, Come over here, bring some of that soup. You know, we'll open up soup restaurants for black people. And we'll let y'all, you know, do everybody nails and feet. And that's why the Vietnamese are the ones that's running all the nail salons. White man did the same thing to the East Indians. After World War II, bombed the piss out of I mean, yeah, in World War II, India got the piss bombed out of them. The white man said, don't worry about it, India. We apologize. Come on over here. We got a store called 7-Eleven. Well, you just send us some good Indian people. We'll make sure they get them a 7-Eleven in the black community. They'll be able to make money off these black people. You understand? And God said, that's a, that, that, that is infuriate, infuriate, infuriates the Lord. Makes him angry as hell that we are reduced to being the cattle that these other nations get to come over here and feed off of. You understand? And it's all due to, again, us not knowing who we are, not having no self-esteem, no self-pride, and not knowing that we have the ability and the power to create more than everything these other nations are offering us. All right? Um, drop that. Let me get Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 17. Why is it that the Asian and the Arab and the East Indian can come over here and open up a business? Why is it that these other nations are allowed to be entrepreneurs and open up businesses but we're stuck being the ones who um can only be be their consumers let's read okay book of deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 17 curse shall be thy basket and thy store yes and the lord said he was going to curse our basket and our store when black people go to open up a business in the black community what happens no support you understand? And you can have a black business where you got better everything than what them other, other stores got. But because you black, what black people going to do? Oh, man, let me get a discount, brother. <clears throat> oh, sis, come on. I'll pay you the rest next week. Man, right, prices all high. Why should you charge and all that for this and for that? When your price is better than what the chinks want. That's a curse on us. That's a punishment from the Lord because what? We don't look at one another the way we look at the mother nation. We'll pay extra money to the mother nations because, oh, you know, them Chinese, they want their money. You can't even come to them with 10 cents short. But you got a business, and they look at you like, oh, nigga, come on. You can let me go till next week. You're supposed to be my sister. You're supposed to be my brother. But why, can't, why you look at the Chinese man with more respect than you look at me? Because I'm not as cruel as him? That definitely be what it be. Our people, we respond to, I won't say we respond to cruelty. But we have a respect for that Chinese man that won't let us go for five cents. We hate that motherfucker, but we had that five cents when we come to his ass next time. You ever see a brother get the Chinese man won't let him go for ten cents? Brother be like, man, I've been I've been shopping here for seventeen years. You watched me grow up, Mister Kim. Does he say I'll never shop here again? Ah, oh, that nigga be back tomorrow. That's why the Chinese man say, "Fuck it, nah, man, I can't let you go for ten cents." You understand? But we started business. We try to try to open our thing up. We don't get the support that we need. We don't get the love. And guess what? You you black and got a business. Your shit dead if you don't get no love in the hood. Why? Cause ain't nobody else gonna support your shit. You gonna have a black business and you what you gonna sell to Chinese people? Good luck with that shit. You gonna go to the white neighborhood and set up shop? Good luck. It ain't happening. You understand? And that's we don't recognize that. We don't realize that. We the only ones that we got. If we're not going to support us, then nobody's going to support us. You understand? The Lord said curse is going to be our basket and our store. You understand? What's also cursed is try to build a business under these other nations. Try to build you a black, uh, a, 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 a black salon, but getting your goods from the Koreans. Koreans going to make sure you get every reject piece of shit weave that there is. You want to open up your own weave store? You better not buy from the Koreans. You better get you a plug that's, you know, overseas somewhere because you go get hand-me-downs from the Koreans, they're going to give you all the shitty, horrible weed. They give you weaves with lice in it and some more shit. You go selling the sisters, you best get lice. Now, now, now they taking you to the Better Business Bureau. 
you getting all types of finer. You understand? Lord said, curse going to be our basket and our store. The things that we buy, we don't get top quality when we buy from these other nations. And if we go to open up our own, then our own is not going to support and respect us the way that they do these other nations. You understand? And the only way we're going to be able to get that type of support from our own is if we, there has to come an education before we can learn to love one another. You understand? The condition we're in right now, we're not, we not able to love one another the way we need to. You understand? Even if you got, man, if you got the, I'm, I love black people, I'm going to support all black businesses. You're going to go into black business, and you're going to find something to be mad about. Because damn near, if you ain't got the truth, it's hard to love black, to support anything black. I went to, uh, told me, yeah, the sister here told me about that, uh, what's that black place? Place where you get them, uh, them biscuits from. Chef Tams. I was told by this place in Memphis, Chef Tams is a beautiful place. Go to Chef Tams. I go to Chef Tams. Half the shit ain't on the menu. They ain't half the shit on the menu. <laughs> oh, we ain't got that, brother. Oh, brother, I'm sorry. We ain't got that today. Oh, man, well, you know, in a couple of weeks, we opening up a new, 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 new uh, restaurant over here. We have it then. And I'm in my mind like, man, what the? I can't eat nothing on this goddamn menu. Everything that's lawful, y'all ain't got. Right. All I can get is these goddamn cinnamon biscuits. I don't want, I ate cinnamon biscuits already, nigga. Give me something that I can eat. But I had to say, you know, well, you know what? Give me a grilled cheese sandwich, brother. Uh, overpriced grilled cheese sandwich. I really ain't want no grilled cheese sandwich, but fuck it. Y'all black. I'm black. But give me a grilled cheese sandwich. I ate that grilled cheese sandwich and, was, and didn't want it, but I did it anyway. But you, if it need you, I had a truth in order to do that. If it wasn't for the truth. I'd have been like, man, fuck y'all niggas. Fuck Chef Tam. Fuck all this shit. I'm, I, I go feed myself, goddamn it. But <laughs> it's gonna take. Uh, uh, it's going to take some correction in the way that we think and the way that we perceive one another in order to be able to overcome all the obstacles that stand in the way of us, you know, helping one another to get to where it is that, we, that we're not going to be able to get if we don't love and support one another. Everybody understand? Let me get Isaiah chapter 3, verse 24, all right? Now, the book of Isaiah, the third chapter, when it comes to this consumerism, what we have to understand is, is okay how can i put it how can i put it okay hmm. consumerism okay I'm, I'm trying to find a way to say this um A lot of the consumerism that exists in uh, the black community today is based off of a woman's taste. You understand? If you, and, and I say that to say this. The culture in the black community really for the past, I want to say 20 years, has been built off of what caters to a woman's perspective or a woman's view. When it comes to the men's clothing, when it comes to you know what's what's popular in fashion when it comes to what's the things that are selling out the stores the most a lot of it is catered to women and a lot of that that catering to women came along in the time when the shift when it came to finances in the black community came towards black women having and the black man that happened you know what i'm saying there was a time in the black community where Spending was minimal because the men were the ones in control of the money. The men were the men were the ones deciding what get bought, what didn't get bought. Most of the times, a woman, her buying was reduced to what we need in the house. That's why the first the first marketing that was done in America was done with was done on during commercials on soap operas. You understand? During the day, while men was out working, men was on the job. The wives was at home taking care of the kids, watching them stories, and every five minutes there was a stop for them to play a commercial. The Sears catalog, the Macy's catalog, all them little shopping catalogs was geared towards women and what women liked because women were the ones who had the time to think about what needed to be bought. You know what I'm saying? When it came, and that's and that's why during that time the culture for men was really suits. You know what I'm saying? Man, all a man bought was a nice suit. Maybe get him some little what's name, some boots or something like that. But it wasn't a lot of 
weird dressing that was going on. Man, just, you got your suit, did your thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, and even in the in, in, in the 80s and the 90s, I, the marketing was still more geared towards women, women's fashion, what women like, the runways. Was, you know what I'm saying? Them fashion shows was about women's dresses and the fall catalog and this and that. But then in the late 90s and the early 2000s, it started to shift to where now men were being brought into the whole fashion world and the fashion game. And I feel like it's because there started to be more of a feminine spirit in how black men was being raised and how black men were viewing themselves as far as looking good and the fashion and things like that. Nowadays, you have full out femininity across the board when it comes to fashion. There's clothes out there that men can buy that also women could wear. There's jeans that men can buy that really belong on a woman's body. You know what I'm saying? So we in a condition now where the spirit of consumerism is also in the men. Now, when I was coming up, Charles Doc, you could see you attest to this if I'm wrong in that. As a man, it wasn't no nothing wrong with matching. You wanted to match, you wanted to be fresh. But it wasn't a competition with your woman. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, I got the Gucci and the, and the Gucci and the Louis. It's like, when I was coming up, we didn't care about none of that shit. We didn't really care about no name brand. Only name brand that mattered was Jordan. You got some Jordans on and you fresh. But it wasn't, you know, yeah, I got the Gucci belt and the Louis scarf. And then, who cares about that shit? I nobody give a fuck about no brand names but women. You know what I'm saying? So na nowadays, the fashion has become more feminine because the men have, I mean, the men have, the fashion become more feminine because the men have become more feminine. But all of that was made possible by a lot of, by the, the masculinity of men not being in the homes, not being present in the community. You know what I'm saying? Because of what happened with crack and what happened with a lot of our fathers and our grandfathers and uncles being, you know, saying either going to jail, being destroyed by drugs or, or not being around, being present in the family. There's a lot more femininity that exists in the black community. And along with that femininity comes a lot more of the of the um materialistic necessities. You know what I'm saying? And so these next scriptures we're gonna go into is about the destruction, well, the prophecy that the Lord gave concerning the destruction of black women, but it also fits into this consumerism culture that we have in the black community that now is no longer restricted to black women, but it also, you know what I'm saying, includes black men. All right, let me get um, Isaiah chapter 3. Let's start at verse 16. The book of Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16. Moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are hearty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanted eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tingling with their feet. Here's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is, why he's addressing the daughters of Israel. Because even in our destruction and our wickedness, the daughters of Zion were proud. The daughters of our people did not want to hear, you got to stop being a hoe. They did not want to hear, you know, you ain't got nothing to be proud about. They did not want to hear that the community is destroyed because of you. Why? Because they was beautiful and they was bad and everybody wanted them and they knew that they was the shit. The Lord said, because they want because they're haughty, because they got their noses in the air, and they, they got their wanton eyes and they walking and mincing as they go and making and making a tickling with their feet, because they think they so bad, because they think they so beautiful, and can't nobody tell them nothing. Here's what the Lord said was gonna happen. Read on. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret. The Lord said, because they was too proud to be told anything, too proud to acknowledge their wrongdoing, the Lord said he was going to smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Now, this is twofold. Part of it is the Lord saying that he was going to des destroy their head take away the beauty of their hair, but it's also talking about taking away the the pride of them being in rulership. You understand? If they're the head, the Lord said he was going to smite them with the scab. And that's why in the black community today, when a black woman is in charge, when black women are in rulership, 
we are destroyed. We fall and we fail because that's not the place that women were meant to be in, in, in our community, in authority and in charge. Everybody understand. It's also talking about black women who have issues with their head. Um, there's a lot of different di diseases. There's um, psoriasis. Anybody heard of that? Psoriasis of the scalp. You know what I'm saying? A lot of these alopecia, a lot of these different diseases. This is the Lord talking about. These Lord prophesying these things. You know what I'm saying? And then also the diseases that come from all of the products that sisters like to put in their head. The Lord's saying, for your pride, now you're going to struggle. These things that you think make you think that you were so bad and couldn't be touched and couldn't be told what to do, the Lord said now he was going to scab them, you understand, and discover their secret parts. When the Lord says discovering their secret parts, secret parts, he's talking about exposing them. Everybody understand? Read on. Go, go. Verse 18. In the day of the Lord, would take away the bravery of their tinkling orbits about their feet and their claws and their round tires like the moon. Mm. <clears throat> the Lord talking, he's, the Lord said he's going to take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet. Black women used to wear, you know, little jewelry around their feet, around their ankles. Pretty little jewelry. The Lord said he's going to take away their claws and their round tires like the moon. That's talking about the body. You know, and them round tires like the moon is talking about a woman's backside. Everybody understands. Lord said, the bravery that these things brought them, he was going to take it away. All right, read on. Okay, we'll come, verse 19. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers, the bonnets and the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings, the rings and the nose jewels. So like jewels. The changeable suits of apparel. And the mantles and the whips, so like what is it? Whipples, Whip wimbles, wimples, and the crisping pins, the glasses, and the fine linen, and the hoods, and the veil. Now, all of these are uh, these are accessories. These are all clothing, um, you know, articles of clothing that the Lord said gave the daughters of Israel bravery. Everybody understands. There's a certain there's a certain invincibility that comes with being beautiful and what drives a lot of the consumerism in the black community today is the bravery that we feel comes when we look good when we got nice things when we dressing well when we smelling good who gonna tell you anything when you know that you the shit who gonna make you feel bad about yourself when you know you looking good that's why in the black community we always had a culture of you know, you can't let nobody see you broken. Can't let nobody see you down. Even if you at your worst, you got two dollars in your pocket. You got to look like you worth a million, because it's that false sense of security that we get when we know that we're looking good. And that is what the, the scriptures is talking about here. The Lord is saying that that false sense of everything is all right that we get when we know we're looking good and we know that people can't tell that we're going through hell. It's it's destroying us. And that's what that's what the consumerism is all about. That's what the that's what the getting the nails done. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a woman being beautiful, and there's nothing wrong with a man going and getting fly and being fresh and spending money. If you got the money, you can spend the money. There's nothing wrong on that. Nothing wrong with that. There is something wrong though when that is how we feel good about ourselves. Right. We shouldn't need those things to feel good about ourselves. What should make us feel good about ourselves is that we the children of the Lord. What should make us feel good about ourselves is that, you know, whatever we're going through in life, and we know we serve the most high, it's all going to work out all right. Looking good should be something on top of knowing that you're blessed and, and knowing that you got it going on. But if the only thing that gives you a feeling of, everything is all right, is spending money, then that's when you are in danger of just being a slave. And for a lot of women, that is, and there might be some men out there too, but for a lot of women, spending money is a coping mechanism. You understand? Know they call it, um, they got terms for it. Some of you sisters out there, or brothers of y'all in the chat, give me some of them terms that they use for women who spends money to feel better. She depressed, she's sad. They call it a 
not a shopaholic. It's a term they have for us. It's retail therapy. Retail therapy. Some women, shopping makes them feel better. <laughs> Buying shit makes them feel better. That's a sister who should seek out the Lord. Because in the times when you're going through things and, and life is rough, you should be able to cover your head and pray. You should be able to go to the Lord and say, Lord, give me some strength. Help me figure this out. Whatever the situation is, if it's a man issue, your parents, your family, your kids, you, you some you depressed. You just don't know why you're depressed. You're depressed. You should cover your head and you should be able to cover your head and pray. You should be able to go to the Lord and know the Lord is with me. Everything is going to be all right. The Lord is going to take care of it. And that should make you feel better. Hey, you want to go get fresh? Get fresh. But getting fresh should not be what takes your mind off of your suffering what takes your mind off of your pain. And that is what, we, that has been our culture for hundreds of years in this place. And that is how our enemies get richer. That is how our enemies prosper and we don't. Because they don't have to go shopping when they feel some type of way. They have a culture and an identity. They have something to lean on even when they feel like they might not have nothing else. That's why the rich billionaire white man doesn't go buy diamonds and get golds in his mouth and, you know, wear expensive clothes. He going just like a goofy ass white guy, even though he's a billionaire because he doesn't have that identity issue that we have. He doesn't have that self-esteem thing that we have. Even even he might the, the, the nerdy white guy billionaire, you know, he got him a supermodel wife. He know that woman only with him because it's money. But he still don't feel the need to go out there and get fresh and buy these expensive clothes and spend his money because he knows that's just an unnecessary waste of money. If you got a lot of money, then just go buy you a woman. <laughs> Why you got to go buy all these goofy ass clothes and these goofy diamonds and these gold teeth when that ain't necessary? You gonna get the woman anyway. You gonna buy bags and shit anyway. Just go buy you a woman and dress regular. But we, I got, I got to stunt on these niggas. I got to shit on everybody. I got to show everybody that I'm getting money and they ain't getting money. I'm going to go buy a $10,000 Gucci suit because you can't afford it. So I can make this nigga know he ain't doing shit because this shit I got on, he can't afford it. I'm wearing your rent money, nigga. Why? Why? Bro, who cares? It make you feel better to make another brother feel less than? And that's what, that's what the consumerism is really about. We shop and buy so that we can feel good knowing that other people can't afford the shit that we got. If it wasn't for us feeling like somebody else admiring what we got because they can't afford it, half the shit we buy, we wouldn't buy. Half the shit we get, we wouldn't get. What would you, what drives a man to go buy 300? I remember when, uh, and I don't know how much they are now, but when last time I was in the world of shopping and shit, I remember $300 belts. I used to say to myself, like, why would a why would a nigga spend three hundred dollars on the belt? <laughs> I just why well, don't why would you buy a three hundred dollar belt? Even used to keep the pants. That's what I'm saying. Like, why would you buy a three hundred dollar belt? I just I never understood that. Why would a man buy a three hundred dollar belt? And then he purposely tagging so he can see. That's what he shirt behind the goddamn belt. But I never understood that. But it was it was about because he can't this because I couldn't afford it. I couldn't understand it because I couldn't afford it. But the nigga who was buying it was buying it so that I would look at it and say, that belt $300. And then I would feel like, man, he must be getting money. He got a $300 belt on. And that's why he bought it. So that the niggas who can't afford it would say, damn, I can't afford that belt. But if, if that's what you're living for, then really what you're living for is hate. Mm -hmm. You living not for people to not for people to admire your style, or you just living for people to hate. And when you have a culture like that, then how can you ever how can you ever love your people? How can you ever come together and build anything if there's a piece of our culture that's built on us hating one another? All that shit came from our oppressor. All of it came from our enemies. All of it comes from those who would seek to destroy us and to keep us in the darkness. And, and that's when it comes to economic enslavement, that's what we're fighting against. We're fighting against a culture that our oppressors and that the people who are producing these things, Gucci know goddamn well, that belt don't cost no $300.
That Gucci belt costs maybe, you know, a dollar and seventy five to make in whatever factory they got. But Gucci gonna sell it to niggas for three hundred because Gucci knows that, well, there's a nigga who'll buy it. Because he needs to feel validated by how expensive this thing is. That's all we're going to sell it for this apart, this price. You know what I'm saying the whole the De Beers Corporation. The reason why they price their diamonds so high is because they know that in the society they created, there's a status that comes along with these diamonds. You know what I'm saying? If you go to marry a woman, you put a ring on her finger. The first thing other women gonna say is, "Oh, girl, how many carrots is it? What what, what kind of band is that? Why? Just so she could t- just so they can measure." How much money you got? You as a man, you better go get the most expensive diamonds. You better go get the most pricey band because the last thing you want is for your woman to show up and say, "Hey, girl, he put a ring on it." And they say, "Well, what girl? What kind of what kind of diamond is that?" And she say, "Oh, girl, it's the cubic zirconia." <laughs> and they like, "Bitch, that ain't no real diamond, well, girl. All that matters is my man and how much he loved me, bitch. You stupid. <laughs> the last thing you want as a man is for her to feel bad." Because these other bitches are looking at her like, oh, girl, your nigga don't care about you. He bought you some fake diamonds. So now you got pressure on you to go buy the most expensive grand $20,000 piece of shit when really it could have just been one fifty dollars if these crackers wasn't, wasn't set in the market. You know what I'm saying? It's just it, there's an entire system of selling shit to black people that exist because they know we got low self-esteem because they know that we've been destroyed and we've been reduced to only covering up the things that are affecting us. And they'll set the price at whatever it needs to be set at for us to buy into just covering up. It's because it's easier to just spend money and cover it up than it is to actually deal with it with whatever your problem is and to heal and to get better. Everybody understand? All right, so that's it on that. Uh, I mean, when you, so like, you can keep reading on Isaiah 3. So after the Lord said he was going to take away all of the things that made us brave and take away all of the diamonds and the jewelry and the and the different accessories that we use to cover up. Read on. Verse 24. <coughs> and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. The Lord said it will come to pass that instead of a sweet smell, there would be stink. Read on. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of a well set hair, ball. And instead of a girdle, a rent. And instead of well said hair baldness, everybody understand. It used to be, it used to be, you know, nothing but sweet loving, nothing but sweet smells that came from a black woman. <laughs> Out of every orifice, it was just sweet smells. The Lord said, no sweet smells is gonna be turned to stink. You understand? And there's there's some stinky women out here because of plagues of the Lord. There's certain bodily diseases, certain things that can get in the woman's, you know. It changed her, you know, getting her biology to where instead of it smelling sweet, it smells stink. But just know that that's something that the Lord can put on a put or put on a person. Everybody understand? The Lord said instead of a girdle or rent, meaning what? Instead of beautiful clothing, you know, Rainbow Twenty One or you know whatever the place with you know the thrift store, whatever the place is where you go and buy the clothes that um aren't you know that. I shouldn't have said Rainbow 21. Wherever you go and buy the clothes that you don't like, or wherever you go and buy, you know, the the, the not pricey clothes. Everybody in the thing. Read on. Instead of so lucky for anybody to shop at Rainbow 20, Rainbow 21. Or rainbows. Like anybody, any woman that shop at Rainbow, I ain't mean no offense. I'm just saying, I'm just it's a name that came to my mind, all right? I don't know, sister. See, man, it's fuck soccer war. I, mean, I, I, I my, my rainbow, my rainbow. I ain't mean it like that. I'm just saying, whatever the, instead of the, you know, there used to be a time when we made the high price clothes. We ain't worried about no goddamn Gucci or no Louis Vuitton because we had black designers that made black clothes that we bought and it was priced enough for us to be able to afford it. Now we ain't got no more black clothes. Hey, you gotta hear we gotta go all the way to Italy to get some fly shit. Who the hell is they? I go to your gar wop to get my shit. I go to your gar wop to get fresh. And that's how it used to be at one time in our community. You know what I'm saying? We had brothers and sisters who were named and were known as that's where we got our clothes from. That's where we got our look. But then now we got to go to these other nations. So instead of a girdle, rent, read on. Okay. Instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. You understand? Instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. You understand? Read on. And burning instead of beauty. And burning instead of beauty. 
You understand? The the right at, at this present time, there's many of our brothers and sisters <coughs> that are suffering to cover up, to cover cover themselves up. Instead of them fixing the things that are wrong in their lives, they are trying to cover up. And the Lord said he's not having it. Even if you are covering up, the Lord said that these things are going to be plaguing you one way or another. And so the only way that we're going to be able to reverse the things that we're suffering is if we turn back to the Lord and find out what he requires of us. For us to no longer be consumers, for us to no longer have to, for us to no longer have a, a culture where we feel like instead of fixing our problems, all we got to do is cover it up and everything is going to be all right. Because that is not working for us. It's not working for us now. It hasn't worked for us in the past. And we got to make a change because there will be no future, no black dollars left if all we keep doing is giving them away. Everybody understands? Keep reading. Strong cut. Verse 25, thy men shall fall by the sword, and the mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Everybody understand this. So that's, that's the Lord, um, <clears throat> the prophecy the Most High gave concerning the daughters of Zion and the, the evils that come along with a culture of consumerism everybody understands we're buying things and to cover us up um let's see something all right we could drop that let me get um let's see something Um, give me Jeremiah chapter 50. My fact, let me get Jeremiah chapter 50. Because who but the, the one behind this culture that we've been given is our oppressor. All right. And part of being and part of this captivity that we've been in for the past 400 years, a large part of this captivity has been these other nations, you know, what I'm saying getting rich off of us because of the things that we produce. You know what I'm saying? Why they why they trying to pretend like well, not, not try to pretend. While we live as consumers and we live as a people that have nothing to produce as a bargaining chip with these other nations, the reality is everything these other nations have as culture is uh, is really a, a, a hand-me-down of what it is that we've created at some point in history. You understand? You, if you understand the Bible, you read the Bible and, and understand the culture the Lord gave the children of Israel – you can look around the earth at all these other nations and see that part of their religious system, part of their culture, part of, you know, their whatever their practices or their um their rituals are. It's hand me down stuff that comes from us. You look at the look at the um the East Indians, for example, and you look at their whole their their um how they worship their gods and the whole the meditating and the yoga and all of this stuff. Well, that whole meditation thing comes from praying, comes from the Bible, comes from the culture that we the culture that the Lord gave us of, you know, saying connecting to that high power, of going to the most high in privacy and and and, and putting your soul at ease. You understand? That how they do that whole um, that whole meditating and that whole chanting thing, that's a hand me down of what the Lord gave to us. You know what I'm saying? Um, you go look at, you look at the, you look at white people's culture, more literally, all the fashion that exists in America comes from black people. You understand? We the ones that, you know, the music, 
the culture. We're the ones that have created all these industries that white people have gotten rich selling cultures to these other nations, but we we don't get none of the credit for it. We don't get none of the, we don't reap, reap none of the benefits. Everybody understands. You know what I'm saying? So a big part of the white man's capitalism is him being able to sell what we produce to the other nations and us not getting none of the benefits from it, not reaping none of the benefits from it. All right. And that's why the, that's what the Lord is talking about here in Jeremiah 50, Isaiah 47, and in Revelations. Let me get um try to find the scripture for you. Uh, uh, Look Jeremiah 51. Come on, come on. <clears throat> the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 1. The word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. And these are the laws that Jeremiah spoke against Babylon. You understand? Know these words today are the words spoken against Esau because Esau is the daughter of Babylon. Esau, the land of America, is today the land of the Chaldeans. All right? Read on. God. Declare ye among the nations, and publish, and set up a standard. Publish and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken. Baal is confound. Merodach is broken in pieces. Her idols are confound. Her images are broken in pieces. Uh, you can drop from there and drop down to verse 17. Go on, God. Oh, drop verse 16. It's like, go on, God. Verse 16, cut off the sword from Babylon and him that handled the sickle in the time of harvest. For fear of the, for, for fear of the oppressing sword, they shall turn everyone to his people and they shall flee everyone to his own land. You understand? And that's the time that we're living in. We're living in a time where we're going to begin to see the Most High start to move on America, start to move on our oppressor. And as Most High moves on the oppressor, Everybody is going to start to leave this place. The Asians going to have to go, but the, the Koreans going to go back to Korea. East Indians going to go back to East India. The Arabs going to go back to their different countries. And as these nations go back among themselves, it's going to relieve the burden that's on us. You understand? Because when the Arab leaves the neighborhood, he leaves that store that he got. The need for the things in the store ain't going to go away. It's just the presence of the Arabs is going to be gone. When the Asians pick up and go back to Korea, when the Vietnamese go back to Vietnam, that's not going to, the need for sisters getting their nails done is not going to go away. The need for sisters getting their hair done and looking good is not going to go away. It's just not going to be no more Asians there to service us. So what that means is as these other nations start to flee from the oppression that's coming down from the Lord, we're going to be able to stand in the places where they've occupied, and now we're going to be able to rebuild those relationships with one another. We're going to be able to retake back the the ability to to create for ourselves and and, and 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 to service ourselves so that no more is that money gonna be going to the mother nations that money is now gonna be staying at home among us. Read on John Con verse 17. Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First the king of Assyria had devoured him. At last this Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon had broken his bones. Therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. Everybody understand the Lord said he's going to punish the king of Babylon and his land as he punished the king of Assyria. Read on. And I will bring Israel again to his habitation and he shall feed on camel and Bashim. And his soul shall be satisfied upon Mount Ephraim and Galilee. You understand? So we're going to come back to what? We're going to come back to home. We're going to go back to the things that nourished us and that, that provided for us 
and we're going to be taken care of. Read on. Come, come. Verse 20. In those days and in that time, said the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought forth, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them who I reserve. Everybody understands, and that's the time that we get prepared for, the time of the Lord's pardon. You understand? We stand up and we come back to the Most High. We obey him and keep his law, statutes, and commandments. When the time comes for the Most High to bring his punishment down in this place, we're going to be forgiven. We ain't going to have to pay for none of the things that we've done because the Lord is going to pardon us. All right? Drop down and give me um, Jeremiah 50 and verse 26. Verse 26. Come against her from a month's border. Come against her from the utmost border. Open her storehouses, cast her up as heaps, and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. All right, read on. Slay all her bullocks. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe unto them, for their, for their day is come, the time of their visitation. The voice of them that flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God. The vengeance of his temple. Everybody understands. That's that's what's going to come to America and these other nations for the way that they've destroyed us and reduced us to being you know, to, to a position of servitude, not only to the Edomites, but to these other nations as well. All right. Let me get Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. And um uh, uh, yeah, Isaiah, I think it's 49 and 16 is what I want. No, that's not it at all. It's 47, I believe. So like Isaiah 47, 16. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 47. And... No 16. Let me get Isaiah 47 and verse 10. Go on, God. The book of Isaiah, chapter 47, verse 10. For thus has trust in Salaki. For thus has trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge have preserved, perverted thee. And thou hast said in thy heart, I am. And none, none else beside me. You understand? This is this is the the language of the, of our oppressor. This is what the the our oppressors say amongst themselves. You understand? Especially when it when it comes to us going out on the street and teaching and prophesying that the Most High is going to destroy these people for the evil they've done to us. Read on. Come, come. Verse eleven. Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from which is risen, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with thy enchantments, and with the multitude of the sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be thou shalt be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. You understand? The Lord is telling them, stand. And the day when this destruction come down on this place, they better stand on their enchantments. You understand? Right now, we under an enchantment. We under under a heavy witchcraft that's been poured out on us in the days of the physical slavery. The white man has used, you know, many different many different ways that he studied to keep us trapped, keep us enslaved mentally. The Lord is going to tell him to stand with those things, stand with all of the evil works that he's done to keep us in captivity in the day when the Lord start to visit him. But the Lord don't want us for, you know, as we, that's why it's important that we build this truth and we go out and we teach that we accept no white people in here. Because okay. except white people in here would be like, we could forgive them for the evil they've done. What the hell do they need? They don't need to repent for nothing because they've gotten their reward for all the evil they've done. They need to stand on the evil that they've done. Stand on the lies that they've taught. Stand on all of the false religion that they've been putting out there so that in the day when judgment comes, they know why it's coming. Shouldn't no devil be able to escape what's going to happen to them because none of us was able to escape what they did to us. Right. You understand? Read on. Come on, come on. Verse, uh, 13. Verse 13. 
Thou hast wearied, wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly, man, how you say that? Pro prognosticators. Prognosticators. Stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. You understand know what the Lord is saying? When the destruction starts to come, like right now, I, I, I don't know if this is something that's new. I didn't hear some women say uh, Mercury is in retrograde. It's like some astrology shit where I don't know what Mercury's doing, but Mercury doing something that's making this bitch got an attitude. She attitude, she angry, she, you know what I'm saying, and, and don't feel like being bothered. It's Mercury in retrograde. Well, guess what? White man gonna have to stand with that shit. When 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 fire start to rain out the sky and there's all manner of diseases going on and people dying everywhere, nah, don't don't try to find, don't try to make no uh no no new belief now. Maybe Mercury's in retrograde, devil. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe it's just the it's the you know maybe it's the sign of your zodiac. Maybe all these people dying, they got something to do with them being born in the month of January or something. The Lord is saying that they gonna tell them to stand now. With all of their enchanters and all of their, you know, all of their, um, these philosophies and these doctrines and these religions that they gave us. Don't try to change up now and act like you want to be holy and serve the Lord now. Stand with the things that made you rich, that, that gave you power. Everybody understands? So, like, with that, we're tight on the time. We're going to go ahead and, and, and close the class out. Um, again, we have classes every Tuesday and Wednesday in the Benjamin Hooks Library from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. You know any brothers and sisters in the Memphis area, go ahead and send them on down here. Tomorrow is going to be the biblical law class. Any brothers and sisters, y'all got any questions, man, y'all preparing for class tomorrow. And um, we're going to go ahead and get up out of here. Shalom, y'all, b'ashim, y'all, shah, brah, thumb. B'ashim, y'all, thumb, b'ashim, y'all, shah. So, like, I ain't.